An erudite scholar, a seasoned diplomat, and an astute public servant of high repute. Our guest today is an embodiment of success and intelligence, an internationally acclaimed author, a trailblazer, a record breaker, and a perfect gentleman. You meet our guest on the show today after this short break. You're welcome to the Sunday interview, and I am Azizat Olalua. I'll be right back. Welcome back. Now, my guest today is a man who has demonstrated excellence in his area of endeavor. He's a professor of international law and also a revered envoy. He is currently the special advisor to the governor of Lagos State on overseas affairs and investment. He's also a member of the academic councils on United Nations systems and is also a regular commentator on international media. I'm talking about Professor Adimola Abbas. Thank you for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Okay, so who is Professor Adimola Abbas? Oh, wow. Um, that is me, in case you don't know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Adimola Abbas. I was born 24th of April 1968, mm -hmm. uh, way back in Ibadan, uh, you know, capital of your state. Uh, where also I had my primary um, education, primary school education. Um, before moving back home in 1980 to start a secondary school and so on and so forth. Mm. Uh, so how was uh, growing up like for you? Was it uh, interesting? Uh, just tell us how it was really growing up. Well, I mean, it's, I think it's a very interesting question because I don't get asked that question a lot of times. And Ibadan is a very interesting place. It's a place I tremendously love. Mm. Uh, I didn't say like, I tremendously love. Okay. Uh, because Ibadan shaped a lot of uh, things in me, you know, oh. your sensibilities, your sensitivity. Um, but in particular, maybe my, my, my grasp, so to say, of the Yoruba language. Sometimes when I speak the Yoruba language, uh, my, my oh, Yoruba language. Yoruba language. Uh -huh. And Yoruba culture, of course, okay. which is part of our language. Uh, sometimes when I speak Yoruba language and I use certain words, mm -hmm. and I think with every sense of modesty, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit at home with you know, things like Omkayo, Badas, Yoruba, the figures, things like uh, Owe, you know, proverbs and the pretty sayings in Yoruba land, and especially accenting, you know. Wow, to, you can do that. Oh, yes, perfectly. Sounds. Oh, yes, perfectly. I can tell you that straight away. It sometimes takes my colleagues and friends aback because I spent almost 20 years in Europe. Wow. And I think I owe that first and foremost to not only my having been born in Ibadan, but, or haven't been raised in Ibadan, but also haven't had my primary school education in a public school in Ibadan. Thankfully, thankfully, my parents weren't rich at all. So you know, they, even if, if I'd known anything called private school, they wouldn't have been able to put me in a private school. I am confident of that. But at that point in time, I didn't even know the, the word private school did not appear. Were in, there in, many in, private schools at that time anyway? Precisely, because the public schools were so good. They were so, you know, uh, uh, they were so great that who cared about private school? If they existed then, I didn't know. And I never thought, and I still don't think I missed anything by not going to private school. Maybe the only thing I missed, missing course, would have been if I had gone to a private school then in Ibadan. From my primary school, they'll have been telling me, 
the speaking of vernacular is prohibited. Vernacular being yeah, the Yoruba yeah, language. Yeah. So imagine somebody telling me the use of my own language in my school is prohibited. Maybe that is the only thing I miss. Uh, because nowadays I think uh, people find it fashionable that their kids don't speak Yoruba. That cannot be fashionable. So I'm so happy, I'm so, and I'm so lucky that I schooled in Ibadan. So were you a, a naughty boy or a mischievous uh, boy <laughs> growing up? <laughs> I, you, I mean, if I say that, you might be, to be honest with you, I've always been a very prim and proper kid. Mm. Uh, prim and proper in court. Uh, by no means was I an angel then. Mm. By no means am I even an angel now. Uh, but I, I, was a, I, was a, I was a very good kid when I was growing up. Uh, as an example, from the day I remember, from the day uh, my parents dropped me in my primary school. They never came back there once uh, to have any chat with any teacher or anybody mm. about my behavior. The same thing also when I was in secondary school. I will tell you, the first time I remember very well, my, my mom of blessed memory now, she, I, she passed away last month. Oh, I think the first time my mom ever came to my school, I remember, since my primary school, I mean, coming in terms of maybe she was concerned by anything, was when I was in the law school. In those days, it used to just only be in the Victoria Island okay. before it became decentralized. And she had rushed in one evening. My cousin brought her and said she had a, she had a terrible dream. She had a nightmare, mm -hmm. you know, about me. And then she just came from Ijebu, came straight to Lagos to come and see me mm -hmm. uh, uh, at school. But that's what mothers do anyway, to worry. So I think that was the first and the only time she ever came to school, my school. All right, talk to us about uh, marriage and the, the, your family. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happily married. Um, I have a fantastic wife, uh, Kika Lomo. Uh, and then we have uh, presently, uh, thank God, four kids uh, between us, two boys and uh, two girls. And it's been a great experience. I mean, but like any marriages, you know, you have, you know, uh, uh, the usual marital issues, you know, you push me, I push you, but the, the most important thing is that you are an item, yeah. that you are a couple. Mm -hmm. uh, so whatever uh, differences you have, you come together and, and you work on them and you resolve them. But it's been, it's been fantastic. I wouldn't want it any, any different. Would you call yourself a romantic uh, man? <laughs> what romantic gesture have well, you? you know? <laughs> that, that's very interesting no. because <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, because you know, when I was growing up in, in Nigeria, when I was in Unilag, as an example, not so much in UI, uh, because I spent like five years in Unilag, I think the word being romantic took a different turn for me. Uh, uh, it depends on what you call being romantic. I think we use that word like a generic word. Mm. Uh, the other day, we buying flowers or so, or these, writing love or taking letters, writing love letters, doxology. You know, the do <laughs> in, in those days of doxology, you are the only sugar in my tea and all those things. They're very nice, but sometimes they fizzle out with mm. certain ages. You know, I think I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I see myself as, as a sensibly rom romantic person, but maybe not uh, in the very expressive and symbolic manners that I've seen most men and most women claim that they're, they're romantic. Okay, uh, would you uh, say that uh, you're a social drinker or occasional drinker, <laughs> whatever tag you want to put to it, do you drink first of yeah. and what tag would you place that in? Well, uh, I enjoy a glass of wine every now and then. I enjoy, you know, I do brandy, you know, every now and then. I'm a social drinker. Mm -hmm. Do you have a nickname and uh, how did you get it? Well, <laughs> I can't remember many, but you know, it, again, um, some of my friends in those days, because I'm Demola, they call me Demi sometimes, uh, which is just a kind of a, a funky version of your name, uh, per se. The other, the other nicknames I had born in the past were, more, were less generous, because uh, just, you know, we, as boys, we called ourselves some funny, funny names, which I'm not going to repeat here, don't worry. <laughs> I'd love to hear one. <laughs> no <least. laughs> way. We called ourselves funny, funny names uh, in those days. But those fell, fell aside, you know, somewhere along the line. And uh, uh, so generally, I'm just a day or demo. I mean, people just coin your names in different way. Or demi, it doesn't matter, you know. So. so how do you relax? If you say, okay, I want to take time off, off the busy schedule, yeah. how do you let your hair down and relax? Um... I mean, first and foremost, I enjoy reading a lot, you know. 
uh, and I must say I've not, I've not really kept uh, faith with my own reading habit or reading culture. Okay. And that is because, you know, 23 million Lagosians want you to do a job. <laughs> You've got to sacrifice mm. something in you to be able to give them good value. Uh, I love to relax a lot with my kids and my wife. Uh, though my wife complains I don't relax enough with her. Mm. And I think I see where that is coming from. <laughs> but I, I love to spend more time with them and uh, with, my, with my kids to sort of... Uh, uh, I like playing around with my kids a lot. I like reading uh, whenever time permits that. I also like to socialize, uh, sort of go out with friends. Uh, sit in a pub or a bar, enjoy a glass of wine or whatever with them. And I like to discuss international affairs. It's, it's, it's something I, that is always after my heart. Uh, politics, you know, international politics, and so on and so forth. I enjoy all those. I cannot say I enjoy traveling because that's what I do for a living anyway. Okay. Are you a sports enthusiast? And if, if so, what particular sports uh, do you follow? Well, Thanks, a good question. I, I am, I'm, I'm a sport enthusiast, uh, no doubt about that. And straight away for me is football. Now, let is me clarify. Is it thing, really? Actually, <laughs> me, I was just going to clarify that. You see, um, I've been in places in which I could see, you know, youths or, you know, or even old people, adults, screaming, oh, Asana, mind you, and this and that. And I'm quiet, I'm, I'm looking, and they turn to me, oh, the man doesn't like football. Oh. So one day I asked somebody, I said, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, is it because you don't have any of the, you don't support any particular clubs? So that is what being a sport enthusiast has come to mean oh. in Nigeria or in most places. I said, no, I do not support a particular sport does not mean that I do not like, you know, suck. I love football. I used to play football, you know, reasonably oh. well. Yes, I used to play football reasonably well at my own level, obviously. You know, and, and I told the person in the days of Ojebo this or Degba in this country, Zogu, Alu, Alu, I will name every single significant footballer of the 70s to, you know, 83 when we were 80 when we won the Nations Cup. And I know all of them by heart. I know their mm. role. I, I followed football then. Really? You know, wow. you know, fully. And then the person asked me, so what changed? I said, simple. Football became over commodified. And mm. whenever anything becomes too commodified, it pisses me off if I could use that. I begin to lose interest in it because today it's about oh you know uh, somebody who has been transferred they paid 100 billion pounds and this and that and you lose the whole uh, the essence for me of why I, I like that particular sport. So for me it has to be football. Do you listen to music? Oh yes. What kind of music do you listen to? Again I'm, my in music my taste is very eclectic you know hip hop you know. Really? Um, reggae, classics, mention it. Mm. But I think for me, it has to do with what music appeals to my soul. Uh, I know there's a plethora of young artists in Nigeria, and they're doing fantastically well. Mm. But sometimes I, I don't necessarily identify with that kind of brand of music too much. Uh, don't forget, I grew up on the generation of Aaron Oshola. You know, uh, George, the other day I was playing Yusuf Olatunji or Gale Mukaiba. Those are the mm. people I grew up on their music, because their music was and is still for those to be very, very rich uh, in wisdom, in culture, in values, in the most of society. Even people like Ainla Mowra, okay. and you'd be shocked, Salawa Beni, I, I know most of our songs by heart, mm. you know, uh, especially the, the, the previous one that I, I, I identified with. Uh, then especially uh, 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 barista, Indian barista of pleasant yes, memory, yeah. absolutely to me, absolutely phenomenal mm. singer in Nigeria in terms of the message of his of his of his of his of his music. Of course, Fela Nicola Pokuti, mm. precisely. So for me, uh, I have an eclectic taste okay. in music, but first and foremost is about. So if you were to ask me today, who is your favorite singer? Well, I don't even think twice. It has to be Bob Marley, mm. forever. For so many reasons that millions of people in the world still tune to him. Mm -hmm. uh, that is internationally. If I come back to Nigeria, which is also international, it has to be fellow Barista in mm -hmm. those. In those. That is in the more contemporaneous society. He became a professor of international law at age 39, which to many people was quite a young age to uh, you know, attain that feat. How did you feel at that time and how were you able to achieve it so, should I say, easily? 
I'm trying to see the best way I can, I can put that. I was lucky in the sense that uh, my postgraduate years and then my academic years were spent in the UK. Okay. Uh, that's where I did my master's, PhD. I began to lecture. Actually, I began to lecture before, just before I completed my PhD. Mm. Uh, but to answer your first question, how did I feel? Maybe because I spent most of my adult life there, master, PhD, I didn't feel I was too young to be a PhD holder, mm -hmm. uh, to be a professor, because uh, in that same generation, I had, and I still have many colleagues, who also attained the same thing, almost at the same age. Uh, so you are competing, you are comparing apples with apple. Mm -hmm. But when I compare it with what will have happened back home, yes, that's a different thing altogether. You know, so uh, I think, so I, I owe it to God, first and foremost, you know, it's because I'm alive, it's because he gave me good health, to be honest, or she, God, <laughs> the man or woman, I'm not too sure. You know, uh, but I owe it to God first, and also to the fact that I owe it to a very progressive society. A society that does not change the rules of the game in the middle of the game. The game. A society that will not say, oh, you want to become a professor, go and publish 50 articles today and 10 books. And just when you are going to accomplish that, they now say, oh, you have that, but 50 of those articles, 30 must be published offshore or onshore. Huh. It's only in the Nigerian academic society that I hear phrases like onshore and offshore, as if you are talking about drilling oil. You know, that, so we shift, you know, we need to be more, uh, uh, more giving, we need to be more certain, we need to be more, uh, uh, more, I don't know what, what I can use. We need to be more proactive, disciplined in, when we put out criteria, you know, for, for, for positions and stuff like that. I think I'll just leave it at that. All right, so I have so many qu other questions for you, but that will be after this break. I've been speaking with Professor Adimola Abbas, he is the special advisor to the Governor of Lagos State on Overseas Affairs and Investment. Stay with me, I'll be right back. Glad to have you back. Before the break, I was talking to Professor Adimola Abbas. Of course, he's still with me, and he's the current uh, Special Advisor to the Governor of Lagos State on Overseas Affairs and Investments. Thank you for staying with me on the show. My pleasure. Now, prior to 2015, you were a classroom person. What made you decide to join the administration of Governor Akimumi Ambodi? Oh, well, I was hoping you wouldn't have me that question. <laughs> well, I'm sure I wouldn't be able to escape it. I was it. saving it for this time. Yes. Um, what made me join Governor Ambode is, is a very interesting story. He's somebody I didn't know, I didn't know from Adam. Uh, people think I've known him for what, one billion years. Mm. Uh, I never met a governor prior to 2014 uh, really? at all. Uh, I met him just by chance, pure chance, at uh, a friend's uh, graduation uh, party. Uh, there was a, a breakfast the following morning, um, to which he kindly invited me. So, uh, and I sat with him, we were having breakfast with many people. And so he began to talk. He said, oh, he, has, he had an interest in coming to run for the Gossett governorship and this and that. And I think for me, when he began to talk, you know, I could feel that passion where I was sitting. and. The way he communicated his vision of what he wanted for Lagos was simply awesome. And because I, I've been very close to a lot of politicians in Lagos, uh, I don't need to mention their names, but I'd never seen that level of precision and vision and, you know, sense of duty in anybody I'd spoken to until that time. Mm -hmm. After I spoke for five minutes, I told myself that if this guy wins an election in Lagos State, then Lagos will be in good hands. That was just the summary of my feeling that day. I was still gamefully employed, and he knows very well, he's, he knew then, he still knows now. It was a very good job I had in Ethiopia, and uh, but I stood up from that day and I knew straight away, this is somebody, you must support his vision. So the entirety of my support so His Excellency during the campaign was based on that, nothing more than that. Mm. You know, so whatever came after that was just divine. 
Okay. How has your office been able to inspire investor confidence so much so to uh, be able to get uh, investment proposals of up to $43 billion? Well, thanks. Well, let me quickly clarify. Uh, the amount of investment proposals would not automatically translate into the exact amount of money you brought into Lagos State. They're two different things. That is the, the figure I gave during the ministerial press briefing was the amount of proposals we have had exactly in three years, precisely in three years. I'm only using the opportunity to clarify it for the, to the public. Okay. You know, and I've explained what, what quantum of that my, my comment will have come in. <clears throat> but back to your question, I've always told people, asking somebody to come and spend money in your country is not a rocket science if you know what you are doing. First thing is to put yourself in the shoes of that person. If I want to come and spend money in an economy that is just trying to find its feet, if I want to invest my money in a country that in not too distant past, so much you know, negativity was said about it to the international media, if I want to spend my money in that kind of country and I, am, I have the opportunity to be that person, at least in Lagos State, who is charged with the duty of asking you to come and spend that money in my state? What should I be thinking? Number one, understand that whoever wants to come and spend their money, they may have to, the first they want to see, are you ready to even take that money from me? What do I mean? If I send you an email to ask, look, I'm an investor, I need to talk to somebody, does that email get responded to within 24 hours? Or does it get responded to in about one year from that email? That is the first message you're communicating. When the investor sends their proposal, how quickly do you respond to even a very courteous email that, oh, dear Saudi Emma, we've got your proposal. Okay, uh, we'll get back to you. Please give us between this time and this time. It will take us X amount of weeks to work on it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't hear from us for the next two, three weeks, no problem, Saoma. But in the next four weeks, you will hear decisively from us whether we are taking this forward or not and the reasons why we've taken that decision. Pure and simple. Then the person knows you are serious. Then number three, when the proposal gets in, where does it go? How long is the turnaround time? Are we still in the generation in which people say that you send a file to a ministry, the file is sitting on their desk for six months, one year, nobody responds to them? Nobody or the file even disappears altogether. Files don't have legs. They can't just walk away. Yeah. So somebody must be able to account for when the files. So what is important is to put structures and systems in your place. And that's what we did when I, when I came to this office, to be able to track what we are doing. And most importantly, because of the kind of image Nigeria used to have, and still to some extent you know, has, in this office is minus zero tolerance to corruption, minus zero. You don't dare. You do not ask an investor a penny for them bringing investment into Lagos State. It's never done. We must find a way of fighting that completely and uprooting that from our society. It's simply unacceptable. Okay, so what lessons can the federal government learn from Lagos State in, in, in this regard, on, especially you know, with this administration saying that it, it plans to diversify, it's big, taking steps in, in that direction anyway. So what lessons can Well, the uh, we are a state, so we are subnational. The federal government authorities are the overall body. So we work together. Luckily, we are in the same party. Uh, so there's a synergy between Lagos State today and the federal government, which we didn't used to have too much during when Lagos was in the PDP. And the, sorry, the, Lagos was APC and the federal was, was PDP. Yes. So there was always that tension there. And thankfully today, we don't have that. You know, the federal government grapples, like any state, federal government also grapples with its own challenges. For us, what is important is that the federal government to understand that Lagos State alone accounts for 73% of the ease of doing business ranking of Nigeria by the World Bank. Kano being the last, being the other state, 27%. So it means if Lagos State gets it right, Nigeria gets it right. And that already shows, into trans, translated into the last ranking, when Nigeria moved 24 steps 
uh, ahead of where it, it used to be in terms of ease, ease of doing mm -hmm. business ranking. So for us, what is important is for us to continue that collaboration, to strengthen our collaboration, and in areas such as energy, such as ports, such as tax incentives, and so on and so forth, which investors actually want to see improvement, because that is what it comes down to, whether you want to spend your money as an investor in Nigeria or not. So all these things are important for the federal government to grapple with quickly. Because you know what? Investment is one of the most vicious battles anywhere in the world now. The battle, the battle for every dollar you can get into your country is highly existential. And when you are in a continent, when you are fighting with the likes of Rwanda, Mauritius, South Africa, mm -hmm. we cannot but make sure we continue to improve a lot upon our game. Absolutely. Uh, so what is the idea behind the L2TW advocacy program? <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's Lagos to the World uh, 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 campaign, so to say. Um, we have an office which came into being in 2015. Uh, we've learned some lessons. There are some things we can do better than we have done them. So uh, His Excellency, the Governor of Lagos State, kindly approved a consultancy for the office uh, for me to engage uh, those who deal with communication efficiency to see how Lagos can best communicate uh, the opportunities, the investment opportunities that are bound in the state, how we can better communicate them to the world. See, when an investor says they are coming to Nigeria, the first thing they are thinking about is Boko Haram. And as, I, as I said, I've, I've said often, it's tragic that we are even saying, oh, Boko Haram happens somewhere, not here. It's the same country. True. An investor shouldn't be worrying about where Boko Haram or anything happens. It's the same Nigeria, it's just one country. But what is important for us is, I work for Lagos State. It's for me to find ways of communicating what I have got in Lagos State as a government to whoever wants to do business with me, first and foremost. And that is simply because Lagos State has waters that we have not even effectively utilized. We have not optimized in terms of water transportation. I want my investors to see that that's a huge opportunity. So we need to find a way of communicating all these things to the world using a plethora of strategies. So it is all those strategies, whether it's going to be a documentary of investing in Lagos, it's going to be the literature, it's going to be the website, it's going to be some specific kind of roundtable or targeted roadshows, all those put together are the things that we have come to call Lagos to the World campaign. Hmm. And we hope to unveil that in the next quarter, in the course of the next one or two months to Lagosians and to people overseas as well. All right. Thank you very much, Professor. It's nice uh, talking to you on the Sunday interview. Thank My you pleasure. for coming on to the show. My pleasure. All right. I've been speaking with Professor Adimola Abbas, the Special Advisor to the Lagos State Governor on Overseas Affairs and Investment. Would like to hear from you. Send your questions, comments, and any inquiry onto our email address. Is the Sunday interview at TVC News. Dot TV. Until we meet next time, I am Azizat Olalua. Bye for now.